bad? Very good? So the food has been very good, then? Huh? Oh, the food has been so so and presentation has been good. Or the food has been good and presentation has been good. Both. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. Takes a while for my system to boot. I need to get a new system. It's starting to get old. It's about three years old. So. Um, well, I can I can sort of start a little bit ahead of time while I wait for my system to to boot. So, even though I don't have any slides right now. So, what I'm going to talk about is is developing in a multi-core world. So, how do we as a developer survive in a world that our systems are getting more and more cores? Right? And what can we as an operating system do to help you? So a lot of, we, we have a lot of talks done by, by our compiler people about how to use compilers, how you write OpenMP code, how you use auto pair of the compiler and so on and so forth. And that, that's all good and nice, but that tells you half, the half part of the story. The other part of the story is more of what can we as an operating system do to assist you, to make your life easier. And what are some of the design choices, right? I know, like, like, most of us, we don't start with a clean slate of paper. We have a legacy application that we now need to move from a single core world into multi-core world, right? And most people say, like, okay, tear it apart, write, it the, write, write multi-threaded code of it, right? That's kind of the, the usual answer you get. Uh, and that is true if you want to get absolute maximum scalability. Then you need to write multi-threaded code in one way or another. Mm -hmm. the, best, the best way sort of for a developer perspective is actually to use something in OpenMP because then you, then you use, rather than, to, rather than to manage threads yourself, you declare the usage of variables. And then the compiler can, can use those declarations to make intelligent decisions on whether whether or not that part of but that loop or that part of code can be parallelized. So that's the, the, the sort of the easier way for a developer to get somewhat scalability, right? But that, that scalability you get from, from a OpenMP kind of flats out by 24 CPUs. But 16 to 24 CPUs, somewhere around there, you, ha you, have, you have fairly good scalability for a 12 CPUs. Then you're starting to see fairly, fairly like a, the return is getting less and less and less, right? So if you want to even get a better scalability, then you need to write multi-threaded code. But it's hard to take your old, the big piece of code that I have and then multi-thread it, right? It's pretty hard. So there are actually other ways we can do, there's other, other things we can do to sort of simplify the way, the way we are using code. We probably have to rewrite and redesign our application slightly. But I found out that so I, I'm, a, I'm a die-hard Unix developer and Unix user, so I'm, I'm, I'm living and dying by do one thing and do it well, and then you have multi, many processes, many tasks that works together to build the solution. In, in Unix, when we do we use the shell, we use the pipe, right? The building, you're building things, pipe, 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 pipe. And I tend to build those applications, I used to tend to build applications that way as well. You might, I might use pipes to, for my application, I might maybe use a a socket or something to do communication, but I usually like build multi modular that then, then can plug together to get a, a stream to process the data. And it tends that, it turns out that if I write my application, if I have application that is written that way, I can, then, I can then look at the data that I have, and I can usually partition the data horizontally and go from a single stream that I used to have before on my single CPU onto multiple streams and actually get a fairly decent scalability. It won't scale as well as I do in a multi-threaded code, but they actually give you fairly decent scalability. So these are some of the things that, okay, let's see, I can actually log in now, so continue. So that's some, some part of the things that we can do to do. And then what I'm gonna talk more about is then the facilities that we have in the operating system, if you then need to go and do multi-threaded code, right? Multi-threaded code is hard. 
is really, really hard. So we have facilities and operating system to help you to take some of the hard tasks out of, of your life so that you don't have to do them yourselves. So we, we, can, we can deal with the, with the hard stuff. You can think about your application and your application logic, and you can leave things like uh, signal handling and things like that, asynchronous handling and things like that to us by changing the APIs that you use slightly. Um, thinking about how you use locking and things like that, we can deal with the, the stuff stuff. You, can, you deal with your, your application logic and you leave the, the, the gory details to us more than, than, than for you. Um, but then if you're writing multi-threads, you have to understand how the, how the threads model works. I'm also going to go through how the threads model works. So the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit today, I'm going to talk about the threads model. I'm going to talk about uh, something called event ports. I'm going to talk about uh, a um, replacement for the normal libc malloc. We have a number of uh, malloc implementations in open Solaris or in Solaris that you can use for different, different versions, different things. And the good thing with them, they are, if you just use the standard APIs, they just plug in, they're plug compatible. You just either use the preload or you link to a different library, you don't have to change any code. But then some of those also have specific uh, extensions that you can use to get even better scalability to your, to your applications. I'm going to talk a little bit about those things uh, as well. So now it should work. Yeah, thank you. Have you been able to check out yet? Yeah. I haven't even had lunch. Come on. So there we are. Can I get my slides up? <clears throat> so developing a multi-core world. So the things, I will skip the introduction. So what are your new challenges? So, Things are changing, and you, what you see today are, are, are kind of the beginning, right? I have in my laptop a dual core CPU, so my laptop is a dual core machine. Uh, if you look at AMD's latest CPUs, they have 12 cores. If you take a four socket machine of those, put together, you get four to eight cores. Intel have eight core CPUs with, with hyper threading on them, so that for, a, uh, for a, an application that actually looks like 16 CPUs, and you put four, four cores in that, then you have 96 core, you have 96 CPUs to deal with. And the way, we, the way a lot of people have been writing code previously, it ain't, ain't working. Because we've been, we've been spoiled by getting faster and faster CPUs, and we've been basically writing bad code, and faster CPUs and bigger memory kind of solve that problem for us. That, that, that's history. You guys, you're going to have to er start earning your money now. You've got to learn how to write good code. Uh, some architecture choices we can make, good and rules, some good rules to fold, and then what we Solaris can do. Basically, that's what the operating system is there for, right? We are there to create, facilitate for applications to run. 
to virtualize resources to make things easier for applications, right? That's, that's why I have an operating system. If we can't do that, then we, are, we don't have any right to exist. So that's what we need to do. So the world is changing. We have, classically, we have CPU speed, execution optimization, and cache. We basically get faster and faster CPUs. Uh, one of the things that happens here is that the difference between my clock speed and my memory speed is going up. So I'm spending more and more time, more and more time not doing anything because I'm waiting for memory. That is what, uh, for example, we are exposed, uh, using in the Ultra, T, Ultra Spark T series. We're basically using these windows when one thread is waiting for memory to come. We then, we then have multiple hardware contexts, contexts in each CPU, so each of, each, of these, each, of these, each of these cores can then run multiple hardware, what we call hardware threads. And we're basically switching them very, very efficiently. And for the application, they don't notice that we're running another thread while you're waiting for memory, because you're, you're waiting for memory anyway. So the CPU, if you didn't do that, you would only stand there and do, do null operations. So what, what happened when we, you know, when, we, when we increased clock speed was that we got more and more heat dissipation and took more and more, more and more power. So we get less and less return for the money, right? The faster we went, it was harder and harder. And it turned out to be, the, the, the limit seems to be, with current technology, seems to be around three, four gigahertz. If you go up over there, you, you sort of just getting, you just getting more heat, so you become a good tea cooker. You become a very, very good teapot, but you don't get much work done. So what we see now is that people, instead of getting, spending the CPU counts and getting a bit of faster CPUs and things like that, and spending the transistor counts for that, they're spending transistor counts on, on putting more cores, functional units, in the, same, in the same CPU. And we'll see two different, two different sides of it. One of them are actually putting very, very fast cores but fewer cores on the four, maybe six, maybe eight cores on a die. Then we have the other end of the spectrum where, where we have the UltraSpark TCPU and even, there's even others like the Azure and other CPUs that are putting even, even larger number of CPUs in one core, but each of the CPU is not the fastest CPU in the world. But it doesn't have to be that, but it, it's not designed to do single threaded performance. It's, it's, it's designed to do throughput. So we look at, if we look at a CPU, that, that it has an amazing IO capability because it has to drive a lot of IO traffic both on networking and on, on uh, memory. So application, uh, uh, application consideration changes. Application performance will be, be, be driven more by throughput than th single thread performance. So we have to think about how can I change the way of looking at application from basically looking at a single stream of data to multiple streams of data. Things that web applications tend to, tend to scale very well in this because they are by default multi, they are by default have multiple streams of data coming in. But there are web servers, then you have the web server, you have the database, and those also have to be adopted to deal with these multiple streams of data coming in, and you, can, you have to be able to process these, these multiple streams very quickly. So efficient use of exploit pilot, so we, we, we're doing things. So this is kind of the, the extreme of the extremes. This is our Altospark T3 CPU, which comes out later on this year. It has 16 cores. Each core have eight hardware threads. So that is for we, each, each CPU have 128 virtual execution units. So how many of you have ever run a program on an SMP system with 128 CPUs. That used to be a very, very large box. We, we made those boxes in the late 90s. Those were big boxes. Now it's a chip. And we can put four of these chips together. You put four of these, you have a 512 ways SMP system in a 4U box. What do you do with that? Which means that we have to completely rethink how we do, deal with this. And it's both for us as developers, but also if you look at how you do deployment, right? So that's why you see this, this wave of virtualization hitting the, the industry right now, because that's one way of, of being able to utilize these boxes 
is to sort of break it up into smaller boxes. The other way of utilizing it is to realize that the best way of writing, writing like complex software is actually to, use, to have an SMP system where they have a uniform, uniform memory model rather than to having a, a, a cluster where you have everything split out in different ways and you have to deal with data partitioning and data loca location and you just go crazy. If you have an SMP with a lot of memory, well, its state is in the memory. Where it's in the memory, I don't care, it's in the memory. So these things get very, very hard. And one of the things we are doing it, one of the things we need to do here is we need to help you there. And we actually, we can do that because we have been in this business for a long time. As I said, we did 128-way systems in the late 90s. We actually had products then to be able to put these boxes together and to go up to thousands of CPUs in one single image. That never got in fluctuation, but we're seeing those systems coming up now by, by multi-core system rather than discrete, discrete CPUs. So we've been in the business of writing an operating system to run on these type of systems for the last 10 years, 10, almost 20 years. Basically, we've been there, we've done it. This is something, this is something we actually, Solaris is really, really, really good at this because we had to do it Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived to sell our servers. So, what's on the menu? Um, basically, you have an you can architect your choice. So, I call them big and fat, and small and nimble. Big and fat is basically you create these big blocks of multi-threaded code, big processes, many many threads in each process, large 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 uh, memory space inside one process. The other, well. And the pros here is that if you do it right, it scales really, really well. But the cavity is like, it's hard. It's damn hard. Writing thread, writing thread code, writing scalable code is really, really tough. The other way of doing things is what I call smaller numbers, kind of the, as the art of Unix programming, the, the basically the standard way we in the Unix world have been writing programs a long time. And if you do that right, if you do that in a, in a decent way, you know, partition your data, you can actually create multiple streams in user space with, with separate processes rather than separate threads that actually runs fairly well. And the, when I, coming back to one of the advantages of that is it's, it's easy to do that. So it's easier, so you let the operating system deal with the hard stuff. Um, it can, the, 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 key, the key thing, the key place where you should think about using something like that is when you have to retrofit old code. So if you have an existing code base. If you start in from a clean slate of paper, use a multi-threaded model. It will scale better for the long run. Sooner or later, even if you're maintaining an old code base, you will have to go that path, right? But if you have an old code base and you want to be able to utilize new multi-core multi systems, you, 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 maybe you can't wait on redesigning your application and rewrite your application because that is what you have to do to get really, really good scalability. But to get decent scalability, you can do, fat, you can do a number of small, quick tricks to get, sort of, to get started. Um, the bad part, it doesn't scale, it, it scales, but doesn't scale that well. It scales maybe four, eight, maybe up to 16 CPUs. I've seen a couple of applications that we've driven up to like 32 CPUs in, in kind of using that type of architecture. But that was a very, very specific, a very, very specific thing where we were able to partition the data very, very nicely. And then we had just pipes of, of, of sort of processing units that we, they, we, we didn't, they just, process, they just read the data in an incoming pipe and processed it and then sent it out to an outcoming pipe and then take the next data and we'll just very, very easy application to, to sort of streamline. And the key there was that we changed the application a little bit so that it could deal with that the data was partitioned. And they knew that I was going to go get my part of the data from there, and then other, another stream took its part of data there. And we put basically in front of that, we had a small multi-thread application that basically sorted the data into different piles. And then we had single-threaded streams that was deal, dealing with the different piles of data. And that, that's very trivial, but that's, 
in this case, it was a telco mitigation software. It just read telco billing data, did the transformation of the, of the format of the billing data, and there were different stages doing different format formation. We could, we could build up a nice pipe, just send the data through the pipe, and it was easy. Most applications might not, a lot of applications might not be that easy, but that's a way to do it. And anywhere you go, the operating system, you need an operating system that can help you, that actually will scale onto these CPU, these numbers, that, these large numbers of CPUs. And that is what Solaris is really, really good at. It scales up to these CPUs. So you, on, if you run other operating systems, you might, you, might, you might have to partition your system into maybe eight or 16 cores per, what execution units per system, because the operating system doesn't scale above that. Basically, you, the services that you have an operating system, they don't scale past that, that amount of CPUs. So, big and fat, it's an uh, empty program one way or another. Uh, POSIX threads, um, it's the hardest way of doing things, but it's the potential best scalability. You control, you, you control the program flow, you control the data, so you control concurrency. It's hardest, but it gives best potential scalability. But it also requires you to have really good programmers, because this is really easy to mess up. Uh, the next way is using something like OpenMP, where you declare the usage of data. So you declare how this, use, this data is going to be private, this data is going to be shared, and so on and so forth. And then the compiler can use those directives to decide, okay, I can, I can parallelize this piece of code. I can parallelize this, this actually, what actually turns out to be in a big loop, but if you look at the code at first, it kind of just looks at the sequential part. Piece of code, but I can actually turn, turn it into a loop and I can parallelize that. And it can do a lot of things if it knows how you're going to use the data. Otherwise, if you are, we have also an automatic parallelize, parallel, or we have a compile, our compilers can also automatically parallelize the code. But it will only do it on, on loops because it doesn't have a clue about how you're going to use the data. So if, it, if it's not sure that, okay, this is def, definitely data, it's not going to be used anywhere else, it's not going to be shared use of this data then yes, okay, I can't touch that. I don't know how data is going to be used here, so hands off. Um, then VM-based languages, the virtual machine-based language, we're, we're part of the, the, the hard pieces of dealing with, with threading and things like that is put into the virtual machine. So the virtual machine is doing part of the, of the gory details for you. And that's the, the two more, the, the, the most popular language there is Java, but they, they probably they're actually one of the better languages for writing multi-threaded code, actually Erlang. It writes very, very nice code. Uh, so in that case, the compiler and the virtual machine deals with a lot of the details, and the language usually have built in, in, in support in it directly for multi-threads. So and modern languages like Java have concurrency primitives and things like built into the language itself. Where's the where's it in C C plus plus? That's something that's kind of been well. Let's see here. Can we just get squeeze it in there in the corner over there? And yeah, well, it kind of fits a little bit, but not really well. So it's not C and C plus plus not with this was not designed with concurrency in mind. So there's no the C the C language doesn't understand that. If you want to look at the really really nice language, if you're doing mathematical stuff, you should look at Erlang. Really really nice. No, not not Erlang. Um, Fortress. It's a kind of it's a kind of the next generation of Fortran. You basically write the code in mathematical statements, and the the whole language is based around multi-threading. And so it's, it's 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 just in the language. You don't even have to think about it. Really, really cool language actually. Um, small and nimble. So many cooperating programs. Mm, sounds familiar for those. Of you. So many of you are old Tom Unix users. So. Anybody going back to 82? That, that's, that's how old Unix user I am. <laughs> I got my first, I got my first Sun workstation in 85. Um, so that's basically a good old Unix programming. Like they, 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 there's a very, very good book called The Art of Unix Programming. It's a very, I, I, it's a very, very nice book. Uh, 
You do one thing, you do it well, communicate with well-known interfaces, pipes, sockets, and other things, right? You, you do one thing, you communicate with well-defined, simple interfaces. Okay, that, that's, a, a, no. so, the, the, the way you can use this for, for, for get exhibit is it's a retrofit all code. That's where it fits, right? If you, if you start from scratch, you, you start from scratch and you do things new, right? But if you have old code and you want to get it to scale reasonably, you can usually do fairly small design changes in the edges of the software. Because mo of, mo most of the times, these, these pieces of software are designed to, to manipulate a single stream of data. And that data, if you start looking at the data, it's very, very often that you can do horizontal part partitioning on the data itself. But that means that you need to put something in the, in the front and the back to, to either to, to sort of do the horizontal partitioning of the data and then do the correlation of the data in the end, right? But you kind of get, you kind of, because in, in this old single-threaded code, you don't, you don't have any, any concurrency features in, in, that, in that path. So you need to see so that you don't have to synchronize two data flows with each other until, I, until the end of, end of the processing. If you have data flows that are depending on each other, then you kind of are, you, you might have to do 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 a little bit design to actually do how you do, how you process the data flow. Um, we write code for multi threading will scale better, but it will be harder. It will be longer time to market. So it means that you will be you will be passed by by uh, by the company that stays and took the, design, the, the the decision to do it the simple way. So the best example of this in the industry is Cybers and Oracle. Well, this goes back to the like the like 92, 93 sometime, right? Back in 92, 93, on the Sun system, Cybers was ruling the world. They they were screaming on our machine stand, but they were single threaded. And Oracle's database, they were also single threaded. So Oracle basically they rewrote their, their database and made it multi-threaded and multi-process. And when we came out with our SMP systems in 94 and 95, Oracle didn't stand a chance. No, Cybers didn't stand a chance against Oracle. Because Oracle databases then scaled up to our SMP systems. Where, whereas, whereas the Cybers database at that point in time, they were basically locked onto sort of what you could get out of one CPU. So that, that's kind of if you go into history, so that, and that's. The choice they made, they made a choice actually to do a complete, and on the this time they actually did a complete rewrite to write a fully threaded one big process model. Whereas Oracle kind of took the hybrid way of kind of, okay, I can do multi-threading parts and I can kind of do multi-processors, front the processes as well to get scalability, right, rather than having one big multi-threaded server. And when, when Cybase came out with their multi-threaded server, the train was, the trains left the station. It was like, bye bye. And you can see the size of the two companies, right? So it's um, time to market and keeping you on the market and keeping you sort of uh, keeping you uh, on the cutting line is an important thing. Um, so one of the one of the questions I get, I've got when I've been talking to developers and sort of when we sort of sort of throwing out ideas. So. That means that we have to create a lot of new processes, shortly processes, and that's expensive, right? Well, it turns out that with, with both improvements in operating system and in processes, it's actually not that expensive anymore to create processes. So it turns out that the, the cost of that has gone down fairly drastically. So it's actually not that bad. It is a lot more expensive than creating threads, but it's not that bad as, as, as it used to be. So it used to be pretty bad, now it's not that bad, but it's, it's getting better. So hybrid, which is kind of the middle way. So you, you multi-thread part of your, your old code and you using, you still use multiple processes and you kind of, which is kind of the model that you usually see where people ending up with when they try to retrofit old code to scale on a multi-core core system, right? So look at your application logic and See what things that are, which, where, where can I do right multi-thread? Where, 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 where can I multi-thread my code 
without having to do too much re-architecture of the design. So I don't have to redesign. I don't have to like throw everything away. I can reuse most, the most part of the code, but I, I kind of look at where are my hotspots in my, 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 my application, and I, I kind of focus on those parts to create an application that, can't, that scales, that at least starting to scale on, on a multi-core system. So grab the low-hanging fruit first, and one way you can actually start to looking at this, actually using compilers like the, the, the R Sun Studio compilers, that you can just tell it to do minus minus auto par, and it will try to find loops in your code and parallelize it yourself. It will scale reasonably to like four, six CPU, something like that, and it's a, it's a good start. Uh, it will it will look for nested loops. Non-loop code will just be okay. This is not loop. I don't loop. I don't do that. So. It, it's a start of getting parallelization, but 